Welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as always, I will be your guide through this hour of incredibly interesting information, talk, and uh, who knows what. I have three wonderful guests today whom I'd like to uh, introduce you to. No, wait. To whom I'd like to introduce you. Grammar is always important as well. Um, Jenny Pizer, who is the Marriage Project Director at Lambda Legal. Jenny, welcome back. Great to be with you. Always glad to have you on the show. Uh, a new guest today, Peter Wren, who is a staff attorney at Lambda Legal. Peter, welcome. Thanks for having me. And one of our longstanding uh, friends, Sky Johnson, who is Senior Policy Counsel at the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center. Welcome, Sky. Thank you. Always good to be with you. So uh, today we're going to talk about the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, because there's been a lot going on just recently about this act. So let's start with you, Jenny. Um, just for the viewers. Uh, tell us a little about the Defense of Marriage Act and um, especially what happened recently with the United States Attorney General and the President. Well, the Defense of Marriage Act, many people will remember, was passed back in 1996, so we're talking 15 years ago, by both houses of Congress. President Clinton signed it. Uh, this was in the time when folks thought that uh, same-sex couples might start marrying in Hawaii any minute. Members of Congress thought that was such a scary idea, they passed this, essentially a preemptive law, which has two parts. Uh, one part uh, attempts to say, and we don't know that it could be legally effective, but that states uh, would not need to respect marriages that same-sex couples might celebrate somewhere else in another state or another country. That's section two of this law. Section three is the law that's been in the headlines a lot recently, um, and it says that for purposes of federal law, for benefits or protections, taxes, immigration, social security, all these things in federal law, uh, a marriage only means a heterosexual marriage. And a spouse can only be a person of the opposite sex. Uh, and so basically, um, couples who, and now there are estimated to be between 50 and 80,000 same-sex couples who in, are- In the United States. In the United States, <clears throat> legally married under state law are considered by the federal government basically not to be married. It's not a marriage that counts for federal uh, uh, purposes. That's section three of DOMA. Mm -hmm. So the very exciting, important news that came out last month, actually on February 23rd, was an announcement by um, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder that the Obama administration has determined, through a process actually going on quite a long time internally, that uh, the administration is no longer going to defend that statute it's determined that law is unconstitutional, section three, I should say, of the law is unconstitutional. And so in the roughly nine cases that are going on now in federal courts, challenging section three of DOMA, cases brought by same-sex couples or sometimes a, a surviving widow or widower whose deceased spouse was of the same sex, in all these cases, the government is going to no longer defend that statute. Um, huge news and Lots of questions arise that we can discuss, but um, the second part of this news that has implications that go beyond these cases and this statute um, is the legal analysis that the government has done. Well, let's back up and talk about that because there had to be a reason. I mean, there one day you're defending this law in court as the United States government, and you're supposed to, that's what part of the, what the Attorney General does, is someone sues the United States because of one of their laws, the Attorney General is supposed to go into court and say, I'm defending that law. It's kind of the same in California, uh, although our Attorney General then, Jerry Brown, decided he wasn't going to defend Prop 8, so it's not unprecedented. But what, what do you think led to the United States Attorney General's seemingly sudden, but as you said, not so, decision that, you know what, this really isn't constitutional and I don't think we should defend it. Yeah, well, there had been conversations going on within the administration and with 
LGBT advocates and the administration really from fairly early days of the Obama administration. Uh, some folks may recall back in the spring of 2009, there was a, um, a great outcry, great distress, because in one of the cases challenging DOMA, the administration had filed a brief making arguments that actually were very similar, defending DOMA, to what we'd seen under the Bush administration mm -hmm. and um, seemed to us um, in conflict with the kinds of things that, that Senator Obama said when he was campaigning. Mm -hmm. So that prompted public meetings, quiet meetings, internal discussions that, that led to this change of position. And um, what, it, what it gets to is, um, and this seems a little technical, but it's actually very important, the way um, the courts do equal protection analysis. Uh, so equal protection is the federal constitutional guarantee that everybody should be treated the same, but that doesn't actually mean that everybody should be treated literally the same way. There are many laws to run our society and lots of circumstances where people have to do different things. Not everybody pays exactly the same dollar amount in taxes, for example. Right. Um, and so this is a, there's a type of analysis that determines what type of laws sh should courts presume are probably sound, and in what kind of situation should the courts take a closer look. Um, this, is, this is called a, a type, of, type of review, a type of scrutiny. Um, the idea is that most of the time the legislature, the Congress, is supposed to make laws, and they, we assume they go about it in a reasonable way. Sometimes it's a little messy, sometimes it's a little unpredictable, but that's, the, the, that's their job. And, and we assume that the representatives and the senators respond to the voters, and that's, it's an open, messy, legitimate system. But sometimes um, groups get beaten up in that process, predictably, historically, unfairly, and it's the job of the courts to look more closely. That's, that's a type of equal protection analysis that, um, uh, that says if a group um, is, is sort of the word is, is sort of insular. It's a group that we recognize to be a group separate from the law. I mean, if there's a tax law that says, you know, I pay less tax, you pay more, we might be in two groups because of that law. Mm -hmm. But a law that treats people differently because of their race or their sex or their religion, that's targeting a group that exists separately from the law. Mm -hmm. And so the analysis that was done is that laws that target gay people because they're gay, because of their sexual orientation, that's the kind of law um, as to which courts have to take a closer but look. But that's sort of a sudden thing then, isn't it? I mean, if on the one hand they're filing a defense of the Defense of Marriage Act um, in 2009 saying they must think it's okay to have this distinction, and then suddenly they're doing their own analysis about what's constitutional. So that leads to sort of two questions. One is, I thought the courts were the people who said what was constitutional. How can the United States Attorney General say, well, I've decided this is unconstitutional and therefore I'm not going to defend it? Well, so the, uh, the executive branch, uh, the Obama administration, has responsibility under the Constitution, the oath that they take to fairly execute the laws, to carry out the laws, and one of those duties is to defend laws. So the Justice Department, as you said, defends laws. But they do take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And there are some circumstances where they come to a conclusion that a law just does not deserve a defense. There just isn't a defense that could be made within their professional ethics and their constitutional duty. Now, it doesn't happen often. And the letter announcing this change of position and giving the reasoning for it said, this is, they've determined this is one of those rare cases where that's what they should do. But it's not unheard of. In fact, the, you know, the first of these cases that we found goes back, I think it was to the Woodrow Wilson administration and happened under Truman, it happened under Carter, it happened under Reagan a number of times, the first uh, President Bush and, and under Clinton. So not often, but, but it does happen regularly. So there's nothing inappropriate. In fact, it can be quite appropriate. Well, that leads me to the second question, which is I don't think they thought it up out of their heads sort of full blown. I mean, one of the interesting things that's been going on is in state courts, mostly, which do not interpret the federal constitution, at least they don't have the last word on it, um, they've been saying, well, under our state constitution, 
uh, it's, it's unconstitutional to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. And then in the Prop 8 case where it was brought in a federal court, we had a federal court, now it's on appeal, the appeal hasn't been heard yet, but we have a federal court saying, you know what, it's unconstitutional to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. So in a way, the Attorney General, the United States Attorney General wasn't sort of making this up out of his head. He might have been looking at what the courts have been doing over the past decade, really. Um, and do you think that influenced him? It actually goes back earlier than the last decade because there were trial level courts in the 90s that did the analysis and concluded, concluded that sexual orientation discrimination should receive this kind of more skeptical, rigorous review. Those decisions then were reversed by higher courts, but mm. the discussion has been going on actually for quite a while. It's been well accepted among lots of constitutional scholars for quite a while. And then more recently, as you mentioned, the California Supreme Court in the marriage litigation just determined under California's constitution that right. that's appropriate. That it, it had been found in some other courts too. I mean, the Oregon Court of Appeal was the first, actually, of the right. state courts to do it. Um, what, what, the, um, what the Attorney General explained was that in all of those other cases that had been percolating, there was court of federal court of appeal precedent saying that the kind of review that's appropriate is the more deferential type, and that they were pushed now to grapple with this issue, sort of taking it from square one, because there's been a case filed in New York, which is a, the, go, would go to the Second Circuit Court of Appeal, and there was no precedent in the Second Circuit. So they, they had to sort of, they weren't bound by, so they had to do the, the test. Now, a couple of key things have happened that we all should feel very proud of, because the analysis that they've done, um, the outcome really was determined by some of the cases that the LGBT community sort of brought and litigated that led to very important U.S. Supreme Court precedents. One was the Romer case out of Colorado mm -hmm. about anti-gay initiatives. One was the Lawrence v. Texas case um, that came out of Texas, naturally, that um, got rid of the remaining sodomy laws. Lambda Legal was very proud of our work doing that case. Um, and that got rid of the excuse that many of the court, federal courts of appeals had used, basically saying, well, if states are allowed to criminalize mm -hmm. the conduct that really defines who you are, it would be inconsistent to say that laws that, that discriminate against you in other settings um, should be viewed with suspicion. Um, now, these are two different doctrines. I actually think it doesn't necessarily follow, but the reasoning, but it's not completely illogical either. Well, let me, let me talk about some of the possible fallout because, uh, Peter, we were talking about um, something that Jenny mentioned, which was the Defense of Marriage Act has essentially said that for purposes of federal laws that kind of affect married people, that either treat them differently better or differently sometimes worse, whatever, um, that doesn't apply to same-sex marriages, even though it applies to everybody else's marriages and under federal law. And one of the conversations that we were having was because some friends of mine were quite confused recently because they got a letter from the IRS saying what they thought was, well, you have to file as married people. Um, and they said, well, that doesn't make sense. We are married, but we thought the federal government didn't recognize it. So can you give us a little insight into what's sure. going on there? <laughs> sure. So unfortunately, because of the Defense of Marriage Act, same-sex couples still can't use the same filing status that different sex married couples can use. So that part of the equation really hasn't changed in spite of the great announcement that we heard from the Obama administration and the Department of Justice. So nothing's recently. really changed yet about whether DOMA still applies to all these federal laws. It still applies. DOMA definitely still applies, uh -huh. but there have been very important tax developments that happened last year that will still affect how many same-sex couples file their income tax returns, and specifically how much income the federal government is going to tax them on. Mm -hmm. So approximately in May of last year, the IRS reversed a position that was previously adopted under the Bush administration that refused to recognize the community property rights of same-sex couples in community property states. Mm -hmm. And so there are, that's sort of a, a Packed sentence, I'll try to unpack it a little bit. Uh, there are, of course, 10 states in the United States that have community property regimes. So what that means is that, for example, if you are a different sex married couple, 
um, then whatever income you make after you get married, even though you jointly own it and you can both use it, once the community is dissolved, once you get divorced or somebody dies, it gets split 50-50. So for every dollar that you make, you actually only get to keep 50 cents out of that dollar. Uh, and so that's the way it's long worked for uh, different sex married couples. So the state will tax you according to that ownership interest, and the federal government has done the exact same thing. That's been the case for many, many years. However, it's not been the case for same-sex couples. So ever since a couple of states that are community property states started recognizing that same-sex couples can also acquire community property rights, the federal government didn't respect that. So in California, for example, after the passage of the Comprehensive Domestic Partnership Law in 2005, couples began accruing community property rights. So sort of that situation where it's 50-50. Even as domestic partners don't have to be married it, that's exactly in California, right. and I think there may be some other places that I don't know, but so when you, uh, when you earn money and you're registered as a domestic partner or you're married, then it's 50% uh, of that actually belongs to your partner or your spouse. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the federal government wasn't recognizing that. The IRS said, whatever you make is what you make. Whatever your partner makes is what your partner makes. We're not going to take into account the fact that the state actually treats the ownership interest differently. And so fortunately, last year, the IRS revised its position and said that we are going to start applying this rule equally to both different sex married couples and also same sex couples. And these couples might be registered domestic partners. And we have registered domestic partners uh, in California, Washington, and Nevada or it can also actually even affect same-sex spouses. So this sort of is the intersection of the um, DOMA issues that I think Jenny was talking about. And the IRS said, look, if the state of California is willing to treat same-sex spouses as accruing community property rights, the federal government is going to do the exact same thing. So what does that mean? Um, you know, it's sort of like, is this good for us or not so good for us? Uh, so let's say, um, let's say I'm married in California to, um, a, to a woman. And this woman earns a hundred thousand dollars, and I earn twenty thousand uh, dollars. The government is going to treat it as though I own fifty percent of that hundred thousand, and she owns fifty percent of my twenty. Right? So we're each seen as earning the same amount. And now the federal government is going to tax us the same way, sort of half and half, which seems to me like it might save you some tax money because it's a lower amount. Well lower amount for one, higher for the other. Right, but net still, you'll probably save money in that example. And that's uh -huh. a great example. So that's what the letter meant that they got from the IRS. It didn't mean that we'd won on DOMA or they're treating us like married couples or anything like that. It really is about community property. That's right. And it, it really is a good thing, I think, for one, the reason that you mentioned, which is that it'll save a lot of couples several thousand dollars potentially, and particularly so because the IRS is letting uh, couples amend their prior year tax returns to take advantage of this Just one income year, though, split. Right? The, you mean 2009? It actually depends on what state you live in. So uh -huh. uh, if you're in California, the federal government will let you amend all the way back to 2007. If you are in the state of Washington, since the domestic partnership regime sort of extended community property rights in 2008, you have to go back to 2008. And in Nevada, since they got domestic partnerships in 2009, you can amend your 2009 returns as well. So when you add that all up, it can actually lead to several thousand dollars worth of a tax refund. But regardless of whether or not you actually save money, because some, some couples may not see any difference. You may still write the same check to Uncle Sam that you've been doing uh, the previous year. It's, it's still good for them, and it's good for the community, because it's a step towards uh, more equal treatment by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to be clear that the federal government's not technically recognizing the relationship or the community. It's essentially following the same rule that it's followed for different sex couples and same sex couples. Like if the state allows you to have community property or it insists that what you're doing is acquiring community property, then they'll treat it that way as well. That's exactly Without right. Without regard to what the sex of your partner or your spouse is. That's exactly right. But at the end of the day, the tax bill that same-sex couples get and different sex couples get, it's going to look a lot more similar. So it's a step forward towards equality for the entire community, regardless of whether or not it might benefit someone in particular. Now, in states where they don't have community property, are there uh, any, is there any affect um, by the federal government on their income as well? Because we have people who watch this show in a number of other states. They probably don't even know if they have community property or what. But generally, in the East, uh, in the Midwest, in the South, uh, you have marital property, and the rules are slightly different. 
So this ruling actually won't affect people in those other states. The ruling affects people in states where two things are present. First, it has to be a community property state. And secondly, the state that you live in has to recognize your relationship for community property purposes. Mm -hmm. But as Jenny mentioned, the Defense of Marriage Act still has tremendous uh, impacts on same-sex couples everywhere. And uh, because, for example, there are same-sex couples who are married um, in all over the United States, even though their, their home states may not respect them. Um, and the federal government also doesn't respect them. Mm -hmm. And we still see a lot of discrimination in sort of the tax field more generally for those couples. What would some of that discrimination be in the tax field? And then also perhaps you might talk about Social Security. Sure. So I would say that in the tax field, uh, you'll see disparate treatment still, for example, um, when it comes to health insurance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of employers, I'd say most employers, um, provide health insurance to the partners of uh, gay and lesbian employees. And unfortunately, because the federal government doesn't recognize the marriage between those couples, mm -hmm. that money that uh, was put forward by your employer to pay for the health insurance gets taxed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were a different sex married couple, you don't have to pay taxes on the insurance that the employer provides to your spouse. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, is a fairly significant disparity. It could be several thousand dollars a year um, in difference between same-sex couples and different sex couples who are married. But you're absolutely right. There's still, there I think are over a thousand rights and responsibilities that uh, married same-sex couples are deprived, one of which is Social Security. So some of the protections, for example, that exist in Social Security are that when uh, there are certain situations in which you can step up to your spouse's Social Security, mm -hmm. up to half of their amount, of the higher um, benefit that they derive. And that's an example of protection that same-sex couples can't access currently because of the Defense of Marriage Act. Mm. Well, Sky, this has, um, thank you very much, Peter, this probably has some political ramifications, I would think. Um, you know, here's Obama, who's kind of, we, we haven't known exactly since he was sworn in, was he going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act? Was he going to not defend it? Um, looked like Eric Holder was going to be a good choice, but we didn't really know kind of for us. And now suddenly we see a couple of things happening. Let's start with the executive branch. Uh, do you think there's fallout, good or bad or both, for the president and the uh, AG? I think uh, the fallout will be mostly good. Uh, I, uh, I want to flash back, though, to 1996 before we talk about what's happening right now, because I think these developments really are thrilling, not only the president's decision, the attorney general's throw, uh, decision, but the the federal court ruling last year, which uh, has already, uh, at least one federal court judge has said that don't look unconstitutional. But it's useful, I think, to flash back to 1996 to recognize how far we've really come. As Jenny pointed out, this, this bill was passed in 1996. It was authored by a Republican congressman from Georgia, Bob Barr, in, in, in response largely to the state court rulings in Hawaii, which did make it look as if that state might soon grant marriage to its citizens. Mm -hmm. This measure passed overwhelmingly in both houses of Congress, 342 to 67 in the House, 85 to 14 in the, in Senate. the Senate. And liberal stalwarts like Joe Biden voted yes, Patty Murray voted yes, Bill Bradley voted yes, Paul Wellstone voted yes, mm -hmm. Chuck Schumer voted yes. So this was the consensus liberal democratic position on this issue just 15 years ago. Mm. None of those people would support this legislation now. And in fact, five of the people who voted yes are on the bill to repeal it that Dianne Feinstein recently introduced. Five senators who voted yes in 1986 are now co-sponsors of the bill to repeal it. Right. Not just a good vote, but co-sponsors. Exactly. Right. Bob Barr, the author, has apologized <laughs> for writing the bill and has says that he thinks it should be repealed. Of course, President Clinton has signed it now says it should be repealed. So there has been a sea change in, in uh, public opinion on this issue, and Congress is actually the lagging indicator as opposed to the leading indicator in, in these changes. So you think that makes it easier for Attorney General Holder and the President oh, I think to yes. say this politically? I'm not talking about, right. oh, well, they did the right sure, thing, but sure. in addition. No, they absolutely, did the, I'm, from my point of view, and I'm sure from Jenny's, they did the right thing according to law, but clearly there was, there was some political calculus that may have been involved as well. And, and all of, the, all of the changes in public opinion, I mean, there have been polls over the years which have shown an increasing level of support for same-gender marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, so that the political risk uh, is, is perceived now, I think, accurately to, to be minimal uh, for steps like this. And in fact, uh, the Republican reaction to 
the president's decision is kind of instructive because in the past they might have tried to jump on this and make hay out of it as a political wedge issue on their side. But in fact, most of the response was along the line of not, oh, this is terrible, same-sex marriage is awful for the country, awful for the world, and the Western civilization. Now the responses are more like, well, there are more important things to bring up. Why did he bring this up now? That's a pretty limp response uh, compared to what Well, but don't we have a response in the House in terms of saying, well, if the president is not going to defend, if uh, Attorney General Holder is not going to defend, we're going to de defend sure. the Republicans in uh, the House of Representatives. Sure. Am I right? Sure. The Attorney General in his letter, in fact, uh, uh, raised that uh, uh, that option and the Republicans. I'm not going to do it, but you can. Yeah, you can do it, and oh. the Republicans are following through. Uh, but they, from their own political point of view, pretty much have to follow through at least on some minimal level because they do have, as a part of their core base, the social conservatives who really do continue to feel rabidly on this issue. But if you look at how it was done, John Boehner, uh, instead of they could have done hearings, they could have done floor resolutions. Instead, he did a Friday afternoon, which is always the time when you put something out that you don't want people to pay much attention to, a Friday afternoon announcement that they were going to have a committee look at this and appoint. So they, they kept this as low as possible uh, on the radar because it's not an issue that they perceive that benefits them anymore. And again, this is a sea change because as we know from 2004, this was an issue that they were eager to run on and try to throw out there uh, as, uh, as uh, red meat to their constituencies and to try to to bring out conservative voters to switch elections. Still, though, it seems like in the 2010 election, there were a lot of conservative Republicans elected. Absolutely. Sufficient to take over the leadership uh, and the majority in the House of Representatives, very close in the Senate. Not clear what's going to happen next year, especially after redistricting uh, everywhere. So um, what do you think the chances are? I mean, it's just lovely. I'm very proud of Senator Feinstein and all the people who are saying, yes, they're going to be authors, but they're sort of in the minority for the most part, not in the Senate yet, hopefully never from my point of view, very <laughs> personal. But, I mean, so what? So you put this bill in, but it doesn't look like it's going to, how would it get through the House? I don't think there's uh, any prospect that it's going to pass the House uh, in this session because, as you say, the Republicans are in control. But, I mean, there's a public uh, education aspect of this. Certainly with the Senate still in Democratic control, there are uh, opportunities for Senate hearings on this issue. Uh, so I think it's an important development, even though the near-term prospects for its, uh, for its actual passage are, are, are not very strong. In fact, I think the court cases, maybe getting over a case, but the court cases are probably on a, a faster track to, uh, to knock out uh, Doma on constitutional grounds. But, I mean... This is an issue now that some Democrats actually want to talk about. This is an issue that, as indicated earlier, they were running from a few years ago. So, mm -hmm. uh, and and so it's not just a, a political partisan thing, but it is a public. Ed it moves the ball forward across the across the board in terms of uh, uh, educating people about I mean, what's really at stake here. I mean, what difference does it make if mm -hmm. these folks are married? All these terrible things that have been predicted for years. You know, they, you know, Massachusetts has had marriage now for seven years, Canada, other places around the world. Nothing has changed in any of those states. I mean, certainly nothing negative has happened. Uh, and as more and more people come to realize this, and I think the introduction of these bills just adds to that whole public drumbeat, uh, is, a, is a very, very positive thing. Well, it adds to the public drumbeat, but I guess uh, you said that the, uh, that the Republicans in the House we're not making a big deal out of what uh, Attorney General Holder did and the president did. But we start to have hearings maybe in the Senate at first. Seems to me to be always an opportunity for the drumbeat to, to gin up on the other side as well. I never felt that we should not have hearings about anything just because people were going to say bad things you know, about us or about anything we were for. But I think that saying that they've sort of laid low about it because it's not a big deal for them, I wonder whether it still might require them to start being a little more um, vociferous. Well, I think some, I think some of the president, a couple of presidential candidates uh, feel as if they need to, I think, uh, a Republican, Republican presidential, presidential candidates, candidates need to, uh, to gen up their opposition uh, to same-sex marriage in order to appeal to some of the constituencies. I think uh, Tim Pawlenty seems pretty clearly doing that. He's a relatively unknown figure and he needs to I think uh, certify his bona fides to the to the mm -hmm. conservative base. So I think we will see some of that, but 
if you look at, uh, I think if you look across the board, I mean, Republicans, we read polls too. And in fact, we've seen increasing numbers of Republicans, maybe wives of Republican elected officials ahead of the officials themselves, coming out in support of, uh, of uh, marriage equality, doing ads in support of marriage equality. So, I mean, uh, as I say, they can read the polls too. They know what their friends are saying. And if you look at younger staffers on the Republican side, so uh, the, 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 what they've got left in their arsenal, even if there were hearings that they tried to engineer, would, would be, is pretty feeble. It's pretty feeble. I mean, they're, they're, they're most successful when they can go to a general election and inject a lot of fear about children, which is all that they ever really do, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and frighten voters enough so that they can hold on to majorities. If they have to go to court or if they have to go to a hearing, if they have to bring expert witnesses, they're out of luck. I yeah, modified seems like, that. Seems like the worst enemy they can <laughs> they can gen up at the moment is taxes, not gay people. Well, exactly. And it's it's just, like, oh my God, you're right, going to have to pay right. taxes, you know. So I guess gay people aren't the worst possible thing. And you mentioned, of course, <laughs> that the conservative victories in, in 2010, but uh, they were not about social issues at all. It was all about the economy and uh, mm -hmm. and and their representations of how they were going to fix it. And uh, uh, there's no there's no social conservative mandate anywhere. Uh, in the country based on, on, on 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and I think, again, uh, the, the, the sober Republican leadership recognizes that. So, um, Jenny Sky said, well, he thought perhaps, uh, and, and really this is to open it to everybody, but what about the cases that are pending? Um, what do you see happening with them? They're, they're cases brought against the federal government about the Defense of Marriage Act that it's unconstitutional because it singles out same-sex marriages? That's right. That's right. I mean, there's uh, now uh, roughly about eight or nine such cases. Um, uh -huh. They deal with different things, but they, they some of them de do deal with taxes. Uh, some of them deal with Social Security and, and survivor benefits. There are some actually dealing with immigration. So there's a range of issues. Immigration, like I came in and I can't bring my spouse. That's right. A, a, a U.S. citizen uh -huh. whose, whose other half uh -huh. um, is not a U.S. citizen who wants to be able to adjust their immigration status, which has been part of our immigration system for a very long time, but not for a same-sex spouse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, your question of sort of what brought this about, and I was talking about, you know, there, there have been conversations for a long time, but among the most important things that's happened is, as Sky was saying, is that there are now real life married lesbian and gay couples all over the place. And so it, both in the, the cases have put spotlights on real people mm -hmm. so that not just their neighbors and the judge, but also the public can see through the educational work and members of Congress and people in the administration have been able to see what this means for real people. Um, and and a, a sort of a side development that's incredibly important is there's been a lot more research um, and official policy statements from the social science groups, from the leading experts about um, human development and child development in particular. Mm -hmm. So something very important the administration did last year actually was in the defense of some of these cases to say, we affirmatively disclaim any reliance on that kind of argument that it somehow benefits children to deny marriage to same-sex couples. So the federal couples. government's sort of been cutting back on its defense little by little. Little by little, but in very important ways uh -huh. because the congressional record from 96 really had contained a lot of really actually quite offensive uh, statements about how gay people or same-sex relationships are immoral contrary to American traditions, a lot about religion and Judeo-Christian morality, but there were also things said about the needs of children, mm -hmm. sort of these ideas that Sky was, was alluding to, that we always have been bedeviled by sometimes overt and sometimes the murmurings that somehow LGBT people are a threat to kids, you know, the whisper campaign, and sometimes it's overt, and there was a lot of that in the congressional record. So when In, in the original uh, argument. For the, for the passage of DOMA back mm -hmm. in 96. So the government has since said earlier in the cases, and it was reiterated in this letter by the Attorney General, that, that this government recognizes that the scientific consensus has evolved since then. There was not much research back then in 96. There was certainly some, um, and there was not evidence suggesting that we are a threat to kids, but there's a lot more data now. 
and there is this professional consensus among the experts, and this is an administration that does take science seriously, wants to get to a sound answer, and so they changed their policy position and they changed the arguments they were willing to make. And so when they got to the position last um, month of needing to articulate arguments in a brief, they said, you know, we, we, we look at these arguments and we, we're no longer willing to say that there's a public purpose discriminating against gay people because of the needs of kids. And we're also not willing to say that sexual orientation is something people choose. We know it's not. It's an innate characteristic and people get treated unfairly because of it without it being something people can opt out of. So th that also came from uh, better understanding and respect for social science research. So do you see much excitement, I mean, or uh, interest in the community generally because of these uh, developments? I mean, you're pretty optimistic, Sky, I noticed. I'm very optimistic, and I think uh, amongst the, the activists, certainly the, the lawyers, the people who uh, work in the LGBT organizations, I don't know how much uh, the rank and file are, are paying attention to these developments because although they're hugely significant, we're living in a time when there are all kinds of massive global issues that uh, to the extent people are paying attention to what's in current affairs, there's a lot of other stuff going on. But uh, everybody that I know and talk with is very, very, I mean, it just, it's really thrilling. I mean, it's really thrilling to see Well, but these aren't changes. you getting questions about, well, does this mean we can go get married now? I mean. Well, we are getting that, and I, and I know uh, Peter is the lucky or unlucky recipient about a lot of the questions about, about taxes, where some of what we're seeing is, is people, um, I mean, the federal law is starting to have implications to uh, in people's lives, and mm -hmm. it and it may not be fun, but I mean your your phone is kind of ringing off the hook at this point. Yes, well, we've been doing a couple of seminars around the tax developments, and we've been seeing a lot of confusion about it. I think that's sort of echoed in a lot of different areas where the federal government is trying to move from a place of no equality to equality, and there's going to be some growing pains. There's going to be some confusion in that progress. And I think that you know this this is another one where people are a little bit confused about whether or not the administration will no longer enforce the Defense of Marriage Act, which, as I said, is not the case. They are still enforcing uh, DOMA, but uh, it's right. That's different. I think that's a a good point because it's kind of like well, you, it's still the law. Yeah, but a lot of that confusion is from really bad uh, media coverage. I thought the media coverage of that decision was really pretty spotty because there were some media reports. Oh, that you mean the Attorney General? Yeah, the Attorney saying that, the, the, well, the President's no longer going to enforce the law. And of course, that inflamed people who thought, well, it's his responsibility to enforce the law. I mean, that was flat wrong, and, right. and the letter itself uh, delineated that perfectly. The law is in force, and, the, and that the executive will continue to enforce it, but will not make a constitution or attempt to craft a constitutional argument against it because they don't believe it. And we did see a sort of parallel example here in California when, uh, when Mayor Newsom in San Francisco did a constitutional analysis with some very smart lawyers uh, in the, the city and county administration there, determined that, that uh, excluding same-sex couples from marriage in California as a matter of state constitutional law was not constitutional. And he put that into effect, and, and lots of people got married. And the California Supreme Court did not like that. Um, saying that he should have brought the issue to a court and gotten a legal ruling because while, while he and all government officials take an oath to uphold the Constitution, and that means to not engage in unconstitutional conduct, it's generally, and it is, it is, that means there's a duty to try to understand what the Constitution requires of executive branch um, folks, but not to then, I mean, it's not their job to actually decide. It's up to courts to decide. Well, but that's a little different, isn't it, between the mayor of San Francisco and the attorney general of the United States. Right. And saying, my job is to go to court to defend something. I can't do that if I think it's unconstitutional, and I have very good reasons to believe that now. Well, right. I, I mean, what, what, uh, the attorney, what Eric Holder said is, we're going to remain in all these cases to make sure that the interests of the government are represented. And we're going to follow the instruction of this federal law that says if an administration decides that a law should not, that it should not defend a law, that it should notify Congress, which is exactly what he was doing, so that the legislative branch would have a chance to participate. And so what they're doing is continuing to turn all the wheels of government to enforce the law and to be in the proceedings to make sure things go properly in the proceedings, but to invite others to come in and make other arguments. And in a lot of ways, that is actually quite similar to what we've seen in the Prop 8 litigation with the Attorney General uh, 
Attorney General Brown when he was the Attorney General, and now the new Attorney General Kamala Harris similarly doing the analysis, deciding that Prop 8 is unconstitutional, but then there's a process about whether others should be able to come in. It is actually more complicated in state law because we don't have any state statute that says that, for example, the proponents of an initiative get to come in and participate if the Attorney General decides that a case has been has gone on long enough. Um, so it's actually that, and that question is in court right now. I think the important thing is we are, um, we're not sure what's going to happen next in all these cases. What we know is that, um, that the House's leadership took a vote to, to um, get some lawyers and try to come into the case, in particular the case that is now before the Court of Appeal in New England that is, that is uh, considering the case that's furthest along. Uh, and some information actually was filed just today. Um, unsurprisingly, they want more time. Uh, so <laughs> it's unusual enough that we don't know what's going to happen in all the cases. But I think it's a fair prediction that there will be arguments made in defense of DOMA. And it may mean that Congress or some legislators come in as parties. Maybe they file friends of the court briefs. I don't think there's any risk that the law will go without a defense. <coughs> well, that's kind of an interesting thing, too. The last show that we did last month here was about who could appeal in the Prop 8 case. And the question, which is now still with the California Supreme Court, about whether just the guys that paid to put it on the ballot and you know got it on, wanted it on the ballot, whether they can appeal. So that's a question. So here now we have the Congress saying that since the United States Attorney General isn't going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, we, the Congress, are going to do it. And you said, what I think you just said was, the Congress might come in as parties. So they have an interest because they made the law, but proponents of an initiative may not have an interest because they didn't make the law, they just put it on the ballot? Okay, I think people are going to ask this question. Well, I think part How of Congress the, the, get to the do way it? I understand that is that, and, and this, these two questions have been, have been um, teed up in the Prop 8 case. There's a question of whether somebody can participate as a party because they have an interest. They, they're hurt in some way. But, but also sometimes they can participate to act as representatives of the people, as the state. And so uh, mm -hmm. the federal law that requires the attorney general to, noti to notify Congress, um, I think that's best understood as a law that says who's authorized to represent the people mm -hmm. or the, the so you know, society. So Congress might be able to, I mean, Right. I guess not might be able to, but is appropriately able to step in if the AG says, I, I'm not going there. That's they right. They could do it, but there's still a big question about whether just proponents of an initiative That's could do right, that. because federal, uh, the federal government process is, is a little different. I mean, the Prop 8 case is in federal court under some federal procedural rules, but it is about um, a, a, a part of state law the, and who can act for the state of California. It's not necessarily the same. But I do want to stress this federal law that tells the Attorney General to notify Congress is not very specific about what's supposed to happen next. And it really is then up to the court to, to decide. Uh, because if every individual member of Congress wanted to come in as a party, you know, that would be too many parties. And so, mm -hmm. and, and the case, when you look at the cases, they do things, but they don't give a lot of explanation of why. And there's intervention here. That's actually very unusual. It's usually friend of the court briefs. And so in some of the cases, one administration declined to defend a law. Things went on for a while. And then there was an election. And then a different administration um, had a different attorney general. And they changed their minds. And they came in to defend it. So all we know is the litigation is likely to continue. It is likely to take longer than it otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. There probably will be plenty of defenses made. Um, but you're not scared of any of those defenses, are you? Well, that's a great question. Actually, not so much anymore because, because on, I mean, and you said it very well, Sky. I mean, in, in 96, there were a lot of people who felt just very anxious about what it would mean for, for gay and lesbian couples to marry. And there was this public reaction of, oh, that would be scary. Well, it's not new anymore. Mm -hmm. And a lot more people see actually how simple it is. I mean, I'll just mention one of the cases that's been filed in New York. Uh, it's on behalf of a woman who's 81, whose partner of four decades recently died after a long illness. 
uh, where they both actually had, had health issues, but one, one died. Um, and uh, the surviving partner is being hit with, uh, I think it's three hundred and fifty thousand dollar tax bill by the, federal government. by the federal government because the woman who passed away had considerable assets and the survivor, you know, not so much. And so that's a pretty hefty tax just because you're gay. Mm -hmm. What does the Equal Protection Clause mean? Mm -hmm. Even even if there's some deference in tax matters, it shouldn't make that okay. And a married couple, too. I mean, recognizes a married couple. Legally married couple with all of the same responsibilities well, that's the difference, under state really, law. Because you could live together for 40 years. That's right. You could live uh, in states you know, that don't count you as married after seven years, you could live together, which some in the East still do. Um, but it treats you, a straight couple who didn't get married would probably be hit with the same tax bill. That's exactly no right. No matter how long they'd lived together. So the difference is these women were legally married in their state, and, and they're being treated differently from people legally married in their state. But, I mean, it is a it is a big decision that people make. Sometimes they don't realize it if it's a drive through <laughs> wedding that has too much tequila beforehand. But it's a very serious legal decision to get married because it brings serious responsibilities to care for each other, to pay each other's debts. Um, and, and so the thing that is so terribly unfair is when people make that commitment and they are bound by all those rules under state law. I mean, family law is mostly under state law, mm -hmm. which is why it, I mean, DOMA was a radical departure from our entire history mm -hmm. by creating a rule at the federal level that would decide what kind of marriages the federal government liked and didn't like. It had well, never it done that before. was bigger than that because of the, uh, uh, the requirement that states recognize judgments, mostly, from other states, but it also included marriages. And even if that marriage was one that could not be performed in your state, you can marry your first cousin in Georgia, and you can't marry your first cousin in California, but you're married in Georgia. When you come to California, it's recognized as a marriage. And this was a real carve-out by the federal government saying only these kinds of marriages do we give you permission to ignore the constitution really and not recognize it so i think that was also a big difference about you know so-called equal protection well i mean and i will say the 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 obama administration was doing its darndest to come up with some arguments to defend doma that didn't in the end just sound a little bit silly because they had decided not to make these these abhorrent arguments that were a threat to children or the other things that they recognized were just not virtually true. nothing. And so one of the thing they were left with was the idea that it was a reasonable thing for Congress to maintain a consistent rule at the federal level as states experimented. The problem is it wasn't a consistent rule. It created inconsistency for the first time. And in mm -hmm. one of the cases that I've been working on, representing a, a married lesbian employee of the of the Court of Appeal, Federal Court of Appeal in San Francisco, the Republican appointed judge who was hearing the arguments back in December, um, he really gave a hard time to the Justice Department lawyer who tried to make that argument because he said, well, it's not consistency. For the first time ever, this law created inconsistency and you're trying to say that <laughs> discrimination against this group should be continued just in the name of consistency? How does that make any sense under equal protection law? So um, we have been winning. Um, it's, it's just by happenstance, I guess, but a number of these DOMA cases and some of the other federal same-sex couple equal protection cases that have been going on have been heard by Republican appointees, and we have been winning even under the lenient test. So if we now have courts, we hope, agreeing with the Obama administration and using the more the more, the more stringent, stringent test, uh -huh. I think the consequences are not just about the Defense of Marriage Act. It's actually any time that government treats people unequally based on sexual orientation, and that would include school bullying cases, it, it'll include other kinds of benefits cases, any kind of federal employment, anti-gay discrimination would be looked at with suspicion. And so I think the, the positive effects will have many ripples. Um, right, it's, it's reinterpreted so that we're actually part of the Constitution, as we used to say in the old feminist movement, when we weren't. Well, there's another piece of confusion, I think, and you were talking about your phone ringing off the hook for tax questions, but it seems like the Attorney General in California, whom you mentioned, Kamala Harris, inquired or did something, I, I, we're not quite sure what, 
about whether now we could just start all getting married again in California because, well, you know, you're not going to defend that, and therefore uh, we should just go ahead with some marriages. But with Prop 8 still in place, I'm not quite sure I got that. Are you getting calls asking this I'm question? I'm not here? getting any. Are you referring to the the, the uh, effort to lift the stay in California? Well, I don't know. I heard yeah. that she's, yes, I yeah. guess that's what yeah. she did. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Right? She, yeah. right. she asked if. Yeah. Uh, she, they asked the ninth. The, the, well, the status, of, well, Jenny knows more about this than I do, but the status of the law is that the federal court judge in, in San Francisco has ruled that the Prop 8 is unconstitutional. So that, that ruling is in place, but there was, there's also a stay that would prevent marriages to go forward. While it was, it's going while, on appeal. Yeah, while it was going on in appeal in the Ninth Circuit Court. So was that related in any way to what the Attorney General did? It no. was. Well, it, in the sense that on the day <coughs> the Attorney General announced yeah, okay. that the uh, proper level of analysis is heightened scrutiny, uh, that was the same day that the plaintiffs in the Perry litigation then moved to lift the stay. And they included, oh, as part of their motion to the court, the DOJ letter to the House so saying they, said, they so scrambled at the last minute to get that right. in there, too, because they didn't <laughs> right. know it was coming, but they so added So essentially, it. <laughs> there's not really a, a relationship between saying you're not going to defend DOMA and whether the stay right. should be lifted in the Prop 8 case. But the people who said, lift the stay, we should all be able to start getting married, everything's unconstitutional, look, even Eric Holder said right. it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the main, the main driver of the request to lift the stay was, is the idea that the California Supreme Court has agreed to answer the question about whether initiative proponents um, have standing. Right. And the California Supreme Court said, yes, we're interested in that question. We will now accept some briefs from both sides, and we'll, then we'll think about it over the summer, and we'll have argument in, in the fall, probably September, which means there would be a decision by the end of the year, which is actually quite accelerated for a usual Supreme for a court, court. But not for people who want but to get married. But not for people <laughs> who want to get married. Yeah, and especially right. because, yeah, because the case was, was argued already to the, the federal appellate panel. And usually then you would just wait for your decision and people want their rights back. I mean, the test, the test really is, you know, you're supposed to have your rights. And if you've shown that you're entitled to them, and then there's going to be some review, usually you get to have your rights until it's shown that maybe that that was wrong. We have seen in California with this on again, off again, that the government, the courts, have felt um, uncomfortable with the idea that people would get married, which is supposed to be a permanent status, and then have it taken away, that that just would interrupt too many things. But it, the, but this process is going longer than people thought. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, you know, Peter's right that, that they did toss in this additional point of, of Eric Holder's letter, and that was about DOMA, which is a federal statute instead of a state constitutional amendment, Prop 8. But it is all fed the Federal Equal Protection Clause. And if it's going to be heightened scrutiny for DOMA Section 3 cases, it ought to be heightened scrutiny for the Prop 8 case or for any case of government discrimination. And, and it's, um, it's quite hard to, to justify anti-gay discrimination. Doesn't mean it would be impossible in all cases, but it's quite hard to justify it. So that is actually indirectly very helpful to the plaintiffs in, in the Perry case, in the Prop 8 case. You know, the odd thing to me is that you know federal judges are appointed for life. They have life tenure unless they do something really bad and then they get impeached. But despite that, I think that courts in general are so timid when it comes to equal protection analysis and the way it should be applied for gay people. So up to now, all the cases that have ruled DOMA unconstitutional have done so under this sort of less deferential rational basis test. They haven't been reaching what is really the right question, which is, well, should we take a closer look at these laws because they discriminate against a politically uh, vulnerable group of people who've been subject to a history of discrimination? And so I do think that there's this very sort of important atmospheric link, if nothing else, that the President of the United States and the Attorney General have said, this is the right way to do the analysis. Courts, In a need, more stringent way. That's right. Courts, right. you need to answer this question, and here is the answer. Because truthfully, it's not a hard question. It's actually quite an easy question for anyone who's, I think, uh, been to law school. You, could, you know the factors of the test, and you look at, well, do gay people meet each of those factors? And the answer is yes, 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 yes. And for some reason, courts have just been I think, unwilling to do their duty. And so I do think this is an incredibly important step to encourage courts to do what they ought to do. Well, the, the, I think the, uh, the cross elements, in a way, are a case has to work its way up to the Supreme Court. 
we're not so sure. We like the way the Supreme Court is kind of constituted these days. Are we going to win? We don't want to go up all the way up after 150,000 years and lose. On the other hand, I think lower courts are kind of saying, this is a very big change. I mean, you know, it's going to be like, well, Roe v. Wade, and um, it's going to be big. So we ought to say, well, maybe appeal it, you know, and then let it go up to them. So I can kind of understand that. Um, but but I think that it might be yeah. like Roe v. Wade. It might be like Lovin versus Virginia or I Brown versus Moore, like where, where, where you know the the court said some you know upheld a principle, and we've come to think of those moments, whether it's racial segregation or whether it's race discrimination in marriage, states saying you can't marry this person because they're the they're the wrong race, the wrong religion, the wrong sex. Why is the government doing that? And those cases, I think, are are high points of our American history that that where there's very little disagreement about them. I think the question about the constitutionality, especially Section 3, but uh, all of them, I, there seems to be, I was watching a, a clip uh, of the uh, TV broadcast of the American Family Association, which is one of the most adamantly right-wing uh, anti-gay organizations in the country, and their staff attorney was on being interviewed, and he said, he thought, Doma was unconstitutional. I don't know if he was fired immediately after the program, <laughs> but that's what he said on their air. So yeah. this question seems not to really be that close a call. But I mean, we should we should just clarify the question of Doma. So the Fed, so Congress for the first time discriminating among legally married people. Um, that seems to be a much easier. Sure, question that's an easier piece. Than whether no, but still, the but I think but the it's, point the point is well taken, and and uh, and you won't believe this. But a whole hour has already gone by. <laughs> There's only like one minute left in the show. So I think the point really is what you, you refer to as an atmospheric change. I mean, I think it is a big sea change for the country reflected, as you said, generally the government is a follower. So um, with that optimistic view, let me thank all three of you so much for doing the show, for being with us, uh, Jenny and Peter and Skye and Thank you for being with us as well. And remember, uh, you know, you could get married, you could not get married, you might take advantage of tax law. Uh, things are sort of up in the air, but looking kind of positive. So get used to it.